All right, thanks for coming and thanks for coming to my talk. Coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Neville and I'm gonna talk about Shio, a library that we built while migrating our data, big data infrastructure to Google Cloud. And I work for Spotify, so this is our story. So who am I? Just a little bit uh, introduction. I've been working at Spotify since 2011, since we launched in the US. I think I was the first engineer in the US office and right now I have 300, more than 300. And I worked mostly on uh, backend music recommendation and most recently data and ML, machine learning infrastructure. And I've been using Scala since 2013 and that's what we use mostly for machine learning and data pipelines. And a little bit about Spotify. Uh, hopefully some of you have used it, tried it. And we are a music streaming company. So we have apps that you can listen to music with on your phone and desktop and a lot of other devices. We have a lot of users and a lot of data. And our users created 2 billion playlists and we have more than 1 billion streams a day. So that's, that's a fair amount of data. This is one of our first Hadoop cluster. And this is uh, one of the early engineers, Yon, and celebrating that he solved the Hadoop overheating problem by installing a drape on the, on the window. So, <laughs> yeah. I was in a football room in the very first office of Spotify. So we went to several iterations of big data stack and technology. We have this on-premise in the back room cluster, moved to AWS, Elastic MapReduce, uh, uh, Map because we can't scale you know, inside the inside office building. And then we move back to on-premise. So as uh, of right now, we run a 2,500 node cluster. That's, I think that's the biggest thing in Europe. And those are pretty beefy machines, like 64 gig memory, 10 drives each, lots of hardware. And we ran out of power capacity in that data center. So at that point, like, we cannot grow our Hadoop cluster anymore. And yes, we have a lot of uh, data and a lot of jobs. Spotify is very uh, uh, autonomous. We have a lot of small teams running different features and analysis and building machine learning recommendation pipelines. We have 20K jobs running a day uh, on Hadoop. Yes, so we've run, uh, been through a lot of different data stack technology. We used to be mainly a Python shop and uh, we created Luigi, it's a pretty popular framework for doing job orchestration. It's written in Python. It can also do Python map, uh, stream, map produce streaming, which at the time was a great idea because Python is very flex flexible, it's easy to write, but it has issues. It has performance problems, it's dynamic, type, not type safe. When you run like thousands of pipelines and maintain like, I don't know how many schemas we have, hundreds or thousands, it's hard to keep track of the, and, and, and reason about the system and you run into like runtime errors five hours into your job, that's, that's ugly and that's hard to debug and troubleshoot. So we moved on to uh, the Scala stack, the popular ones out there like Scouting, that's a Twitter library on top of Cascading and which in, and in turn runs on MapReduce. Uh, and was, we also use, use Spark for machine learning mainly. So we've grown quite a bit, and most of our users have no Scala experience, but we've grown over the past three, four years to like company-wide using it for data pipelines. And most users are pretty happy. We also use Storm for real-time processing. And then we use Hive for ad hoc analysis. Hive, Hive, Hive is a SQL big data analysis engine that runs on Hadoop. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of these technology. And how they fit in our infrastructure. So we made a decision at that point, like we cannot grow our infrastructure anymore and it, it's a point where we should decide whether to build our own uh, data centers or just pay someone else to do it. And then we decide Google has a lot of pretty cool technology at the time and they just, they start starting to, to push uh, Google Cloud and it seems to be a great fit for our problems. So we started moving about two years ago. Hive is one of the main stack that we use for an ad hoc analysis, uh, but there are problems. We use Hive mainly with a row-oriented file format like Avro or TSV. The problem with that is any query requires a full scan over the entire file. It's fairly inefficient. Imagine if you have a SQL table of 100 columns and then most of the time select two or three out of it. It's uh, inefficient. 
It runs on a MapReduce, which means it compiles to a lot of individual MapReduce steps, a lot of disk I.O. in between, spin up, tear down jobs. Uh, it's fairly inefficient. We also uh, used uh, we we also use uh, Hive with Parquet, a columnar file uh, storage format, which supposedly will speed things up. It does speed things up, but the support in Hive is pretty immature at the time. And also, it's it's great for ad hoc analysis. You write a SQL query and get some results after an hour or so. But it's not so great for for plugging to your data pipelines. It's hard to write UDF. You have to write a Java class and deploy the jar. It's a lot of overhead for doing this kind of. Uh, ad hoc, uh, quick uh, iterations of, of data analysis. So uh, we consider BigQuery, which is a Google Cloud product. Uh, BigQuery originated from the Google Paper Dremel from 2010, actually inspired the two popular Apache projects, Parquet, the columnar storage, and Drill, the SQL analytics uh, engine. It's very optimized and allows, like, it, it can query 10 terabytes of data within like tens of seconds. It's, it's very fast. Uh, you can write UDFs in JavaScript. That's another thing for ease of uh, de development. And the, another nice thing is us, uh, the consumer or uh, customer for cloud technology, you pay for the bytes you process. So you select two columns out of 100 in the table, you pay 2% of a full range scan. It has very, very good uh, integration with Beam and Dataflow, which I'm going to get into in a minute. Those are the, the data pipelining technology Google uh, uh, offers. So typical workloads. Uh, again, these are not uh, real-world benchmarks. This, this is the reflection of user experience inside our Hadoop uh, cluster versus when we move to Google Cloud. So before uh, moving to BigQuery, users have to wait for like minutes or hours for a job to finish. And most, a lot of the time, running a big Hive job would take down the cluster or take half of the resources and slow down other ETL or mission critical pipelines. And BigQuery manages its own resources and you just upload your data set, write a query, 20 seconds later you get a result. It's, and I think the cost uh, to query like a couple hundred, uh, Couple hundred gigabytes of data is like less than a dollar. It's like, yeah. Uh, adoption is great. Uh, pretty much everyone, like even non data engineers, just product owners, analysts, front end engineers, they can just query logs and debug their, their production issue. We make a lot of queries. Uh, that's not the number of memory in your first PC. Uh, we query like 500 petabytes uh, of data per month. And if you look at the screenshot down there, it's uh, queried 1.76 terabytes of data in 200 seconds. We also use Scouting mainly for pipelines. Uh, some of the features that people love, like Discover Weekly, is made in, uh, written in Scouting. It's 200 lines of pipeline that does, I don't know, 17 <laughs> joins, uh, like has 20 distributed cache lookup tables and hash trees and all that for approximate uh, nearest neighbor lookup. It's open source by Twitter, used yet a lot of successful tech companies. It's very proven, but again, it runs on MapReduce, so there's a fair amount of I.O. overhead. Uh, cascading, the, the next generation of cascading supposedly will run on Tez, but I don't know anyone using it in production yet. There's still like some uh, stability problem with it. Scouting doesn't do streaming, and at Twitter, they actually build another library on top called Summingbird, which runs both on Scouting and Storm. The problem with that is now you have to maintain two clusters, one Hadoop cluster and one Storm cluster, and just another layer of abstraction. Uh, and we also use Spark. Spark has a lot of features. There's uh, interactive ML, there's uh, batch streaming, it has notebook, it has SQL, a lot of things. We use it mostly for machine learning because of the iterative in-memory caching features that Spark has. Uh, Spark supports both batch streaming, but with two uh, APIs. Uh, I'm going to get to that in a bit. Spark runs on Hadoop, Mesos, and a few other, there's a few other operation modes. But uh, a common problem that people face is that there are a lot of tuning parameters, it's, and you have to, to tune them based on your, the type of your application. It's, it's, it gets harder when you have a large organization of hundreds of engineers trying to write pipelines, and tuning it is not so easy. Mm. The next one is Storm that we use mostly for real-time processing. 
So we use it for ads targeting. We want to provide you ads that annoy you the least, hopefully, uh, based on what you're currently listening to. And uh, for new users, because we don't know nothing ab uh, about the new users, and we have to generate recommendations after a couple of tracks the user listened to after signing up. So uh, that was, that's what we use Storm for. The problem is it's another cluster. It runs, uh, it uses Nimbus and Zookeeper, just a lot more operational overhead. It has a Java and a Clojure API, but it's fairly low level. So a lot of the operations that's, you have to, to wire it manually, like windowing and joins. It's fairly, fairly low level. So uh, to summarize the problems we are facing, uh, cluster management is a big pain. Uh, Multi-tenancy is pretty bad. We have one gigantic shared cluster. It's hard to manage who uses what <coughs> amount of resources. And there's a lot of contention. Three sets of APIs, we have to rewrite code here and there. And also, once we are moving to uh, Google Cloud, it's missing a lot of these connectors to the Google storage uh, products like PubSub, Bigtable that we leverage heavily, and also BigQuery, those uh, products that we want to use. So, what is uh, being man Cloud Data Flow? It's, uh, let's look at it a little bit. So at the beginning, there's MapReduce. It's a Google paper. They publish a lot of papers on big data technologies. Uh, Bigtable, which uh, inspired Cassandra and DynamoDB, I believe. Dremel, we talked about it. It's uh, the basis for Parquet and uh, Drill. And then most recently, they published this Millwheel paper, which introduces a new unified batch and streaming um, pipeline data model, which also inspired the one that's being used in Flink. So basically, before that, you have a, two systems, like Lambda, Lambda architecture, you have a batch system and a streaming system. And the idea of Millwheel um, is basically batch is a special case of streaming. In streaming, you have an infinite amount of data just coming in through an uh, unbounded collection. And in batch, all your data are known, and it's a finite set of uh, uh, data points in a single collection. That's the main distinct, uh, di di uh, difference. So you know, when Google uh, started offering Google Cloud as a product, uh, they also open source Cloud uh, Dataflow as a data processing library on top of Google Cloud. And they donated to Apache, so now it becomes Apache Beam. Uh, there, so we talked about the model, which is unified batch and streaming. And it also has a decoupled uh, SDK layer and the uh, runner. So you can write your SDK uh, as a pipeline writer. You can write it in Java, and it supports Python now also. And it can run on one of the supported runners. There's Flink, Spark, Dataflow. You can run it locally. I think there's also Apache Apex, which was just merged to master. So you can run on that as well. So, and it introduces four important questions when doing batch or streaming. Uh, what are the results cal uh, calculated? Like you want to sum, take top, aggregate, and the operation that you want to do. Where in event time are results calculated? Like uh, when did the event happen? When you use a click button uh, on a phone. And when in processing time are they materialized? Meaning when you click your, data, uh, your, your phone, it's not going to generate a pipeline right away. It's going through some Kafka or PubSub ingestion couple of uh, minutes or maybe hours if there's a network outage or whatever reason, and it will arrive on the server and then you start processing. So that's the processing time, which is different from uh, event time. And then how do you deal with these discrepancies, like the data arriving late and or missing? So uh, on the left, left hand side, we have the most classic batch model where you just process everything once they're ready in a gigantic uh, window. By the way, these slides are all available online uh, on the Beam website. They have a pretty nice animation. I'm not going to dig into the nitty gritty details of how the model actually works, but these, this is the conceptual uh, idea. So first, you have the batch, which process everything in one shot once they're ready. If you do it on a daily basis, you have to wait for 24 hours when all the data arrive and you start your processing. If it's a business critical report, you might, don't, you might not want to wait for 24 hours. So you can do window batch, like basically, have smaller windows when you ingest and, and process data. And then the next step up will be, I want to process as soon as data arrives, so that's streaming. But in that case, you, inevitably, you will lose data because some server is down or network is broken and so you can't collect data from certain data centers. Like the, the red dot over there, that's uh, 
late data point that's being discarded in this particular scenario. And the last case is streaming plus accumulation. So I can do streaming, like process the data as soon as they arrive, but I, I can also handle late data based on whatever uh, accumulation logic I have. For example, I do a running 10-minute uh, top artist, and then I process this ten, the last 10 minutes, but some of the, the log events were missing from the last minutes because you know, server down, network problem, and then once they arrive, I can recompute the top 10 using the, the increment, the delta. So it allows you to do certain advanced operations on, on streaming mode, that's pretty nice. So we've also already talked about, so the vision is you have different language SDKs, the Java Python one, and the one I wrote that's in Scala, and then you can run it on any of the runners supported, and they will handle the execution. So for those of you who are familiar with Spark, this is probably the more uh, technically, uh, technical details about the model differences. In Spark, there's RDD for uh, the, the, the most basic uh, data model is RDD resilient distributed data set for batch processing. And then there's a, a D stream for streaming processing, which is really an infinite sequence of mini RDDs. So when you hear the term like, uh, micro batching uh, instead of real streaming. That's, that's what it means. And so that's two different APIs. Spark has in-memory caching, which is great for, for uh, machine learning. But in the case of Bing, there's only one low-level uh, low data model, the parallel collection, which can handle both batch and streaming. Each element within the parallel collection has implicit timestamp and window assignment. So if you're processing in a batch mode, everybody belongs to the same uh, window and you just processing them as, as one unit. If you're doing it in, in streaming mode, you can process each window as soon as they are uh, completed or closed. And execution is also a little bit different. Spark has one driver or master node and a bunch of executors. So the drivers basically dynamically uh, decide what's get, what gets executed on the workers. So you can do things like transformation, which is basically uh, coordinating a bunch of workers doing some kind of map or filter function, and an action which basically transmits, uh, tra uh, transfers data from the workers to the master. Like I want to say, compute the top 10. Just everybody sends local top 10 to the master, and master the global top 10. Uh, in the case of Beam, there's no master, uh, so everything is statically uh, planned. You write your pipeline, say run, and it gets executed, and, and that's it. So just a different design philosophy. And because there's no master node, you can do actions like transmitting data back to the master. You have to basically wait for the, for the pipeline to finish and then and look at it. So why, why do we use uh, Beam and Dataflow? We already talked about it. It's, uh, it has a unified batch and streaming model, which is really nice. So it allows us to write one pipeline that works in both batch and streaming. And we run it on Google Data, Cloud Dataflow, which is a fully managed uh, service. So we basically write your code, run the main method, it just submits to the cloud, spins up the cluster, tears down afterwards, and has everything included to operate like the Google Cloud products or the different uh, storage products like BigQuery, Bigtable. And when you run on Google Cloud, because they, they are running on Google Cloud VMs, uh, Google Com Compute Instances, uh, there's auto-scaling and dy dynamic work rebalancing. So basically the framework can detect if there are not enough resources or too, too much resources, and it will tear down or spin up VMs as, as needed, which is great. And that's good for us, for me, uh, for any, anyone operating a Hadoop cluster. You don't have to wake up in the middle of the night, look at stack traces or tune JVM you know, parameters. Uh, we are paying for the service, so we get support from the Google engineers as well, like uh, debugging production issues, which is great. Um, yeah, and why do we use it with Scala? Obviously, uh, if any one of you have uh, seen like Java data pipelines, it's, it's, it's not fun to write. It's a lot of boilerplate, and it, Scala is gaining a lot of traction in the big data uh, world because it's concise. The functional programming pattern, it's a good fit for data processing because basically you take immutable data, apply mathematical transformations, generate new data right to an, a sync. So it's great, and also it's, it runs on JVM, so you can operate with, uh, interop with all the Hadoop or Java libraries that you like. 
So we use that, and we, there's a lot of numerical libraries that's uh, available for Scala, like Breeze, which is num similar to NumPy for Scala. It does a lot of linear algebra uh, computation, and then Algebra from Twitter, which is a library for doing parallel computation and a lot of approximation algorithms, like Bloom filters and uh, unique count, histogram, those kind of operations. And those, those operations are important because they run well in constant memory in both batch and, and streaming. Because in batch, yes, we can spin up as many machines as possible. In streaming, you have limited resources. You don't want to blow up your, your JVM stack because it ran out of memory. And yes. And we also use Scala macros uh, in production for generating code. And I'm going to demo that in a minute. So that's why we built Shield. It's a Scala API for Apache Beam and Google Cloud Dataflow. Uh, the name uh, it's suggested by one of my coworkers it means uh, it's ecclesiastical Latin, which is the type that the Pope speaks. So I guess it's pretty legit and classy. It's the name of a Scala library, a Scala big data library that starts with SC and ends with IO. So also a pretty good fit. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't register uh, sc.io domain. They don't allow two-letter domains for whatever reason. Maybe a Unicode one. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, open source. It's uh, on GitHub and Apache licensed. So that's what it looks like. Basically, underlying uh, shield is the Dataflow Java SDK. Supports batch and streaming. Has uh, I.O. or components for interop with uh, a lot of the Google uh, uh, products. And then we added a bunch of stuff that's, that's, that the Scala developers like, you know, like interactive repo and a lot of uh, other features. So this is what WordCon looks like. And if you've done Spark or Scouting, it looks almost the same. I would say it's maybe 80% copy pasteable from Scouting or Spark, which is great. So for most of our users who are used to those libraries, there's no learning curve. Again, page rank, 13 lines of code, and it's fairly uh, 10 iterations, and then you have a damping factor, you have the source to destination links, you do this uh, rank redistribution, it's fairly simple. So why, why do we like it? Uh, type safe BigQuery. So we talked about BigQuery, it's fast, it's really nice. And in my opinion, uh, or we actually did some internal benchmark, uh, most of the time BigQuery uh, is faster and also cheaper than writing pipelines yourself. If you can write it in a SQL, I mean, anyone can write SQL query. It's mostly copy paste and then read a menu like some UDFs. And if you can do that, uh, yes, it's it, ideally one, what we want to do as much uh, SQL query as possible. But there are certain things that's hard to write express in SQL, like custom logic, machine learning, learning transformation, whatever. And then you want to plug it into a Scala pipeline. And you can do that in, in Shio in a type safe manner. And in this case, uh, the, the first example, it's basically plugging a SQL query into a data pipeline. And then use Scala macros to compile time, generate the case class, which is type safe. And then you just tab your code into the pipeline. It runs, there's no MP or, uh, or uh, class cast exception whatsoever. And then you, you write your uh, Scala case class is a lightweight data representation in Scala, and it's easy to express your data types in a uh, type safe manner. And then we use it heavily throughout our pipeline. Basically, you just write case class, write pipelines, and it runs. I'm going to do a demo on this in a bit. Um, so as we talked about, BigQuery is great for slicing and dicing. It's extremely fast and also a lot of times cheaper than running very, like writing very tedious pipelines yourself. And with the, the, the type safe macros, it's seamlessly integrated into a, a type safe language in the data pipeline. And we can do the custom operation afterwards. We, I've seen users doing like selecting features from BigQuery and do uh, some machine learning fancy uh, training model or whatever. Uh, in the same pipeline, oh, that's great. Um, we have interactive repo, so you can do all these things uh, interactively. And that's going to be part of the demo. I'm going to show it in a bit. And then you can orchestrate jobs using Scala filters, which basically means like w when you have a couple of jobs you want to chain together. So when you save a data set, it generates a filter that you can uh, 
wire up in, uh, later when the job completes. And yeah, distribute cache, it's a Hadoop concept and that we port it to Beam and Dataflow as well. So basically you can distribute any file, in this case a text file, it could be a binary lookup table, whatever, to all the workers and then do in-memory lookup. We do this heavily for like key value lookups and we build static files for the table lookups. We also do uh, use it for uh, approximate nearest neighbor lookup. We have a, Spotify has a library called Annoy, approximate nearest neighbor look, uh, neighbor, oh yeah, that's the OY. <laughs> Anyway, so it's called Annoy. Uh, you build a you build a forest, random forest of you know vectors and whatnot, and it can do constant time nearest neighbor lookup in memory, which is great. That's how we use uh, that was what we use to generate a lot of the the recommendations. So basically, finding similar tracks, similar artists to what you already listen to. So we use that heavily as well in the data pipelines and other goodies. Yes. Uh, when you write Scala, all the, a lot of these uh, functional transformations like flat map, filter, uh, map, group by key, they get uh, injected into the runtime like web UI diagram. So you can see where where's my code and what's it doing, the line number and the file. Like most of the time when I debug a user uh, code, I don't need to look at the source code. I just look at the diagram and see if it's doing extra steps and what is the step where from the source code it's from. That's great. We added a lot of extra features that we use heavily inside Spotify, like we use BigQuery heavily. We also optimized for different scenarios of join, like if you have hotkeys on the left side, you have a tiny right side, you have a sparse left side, all these different scenarios we optimized for. And, and then of course, different IOs. We also use Protobuf and we are working with TensorFlow, that's a machine learning library, so we, we have uh, interop uh, components to, to deal with that. Yes. So we like it. It's a Swiss army knife of data processing on Google Cloud. You can use it to pull data or read and write any uh, Google Cloud components. Of course, it works with HDFS or local file system as well. So it's just really convenient to have everything in a single pipeline. Yes, demo time. Uh, doing big data on uh, your laptop. Let's, let's look at the BigQuery uh, first. So this is a public BigQuery data set. Uh, let's look at the commit table. I think it's just a collection of all the, uh, the GitHub uh, commits uh, on public repos. And it has 665 gigs and 183 million rows. So let's make a query. So in this case, I'm selecting from this table and then looking for a repo name where it contains Spotify slash shield, something like that. And oh, I need to change the option, use the new SQL and disable cache so that I'm you know demonstrating it's a real query, no cache. <laughs> yes. So it's running, it should take about 10 seconds. This is how most of Spotify users work, by the way. So you do like web UI explorer data. And then I know my query works. I got some results back. Yes, there are some names. I see my name in there. So a query should probably work correctly. Now I want to plug into a data pipeline. So back to uh, your repo. By the way, there's a self-contained jar you can install with Homebrew, or you can just download the jar and run it. And if you've, you have a Google Cloud account and have local credentials, it doesn't have any dependency, it just uh, wired up. So yeah, let's say a rows equals to BQ, dot get query rows. Oh yeah, sorry, let me uh, fix that. Yeah. So I can paste the query here. This is the official Google uh, Cloud API, by the way. If you use like SQL, any kind of uh, SQL library in, in Java, it's not pretty. What you get is basically a, a map of string to uh, objects, and you have to cast objects to what you think it is. So this rows next gives me a single row. And then I've done this a million times, so I kind of can guess what it is, get author, 
its object, but really it's a table row. So it's very tedious, and then if you do it wrong in the data pipeline, you get a MPE or cast error, that's ugly. And those are the kind of things we want to avoid, like running a pipeline for two hours and it fails. Mm, let's see, get. I want to get the nested field inside author and the name, so I can do something like this. Again, object, then I have to cast it as a string. So not the easiest thing to do. Now let's try something else. Uh, I have this macro annotation, so it gave me a type called, uh, it's from this SQL query, and then I'll define a class called GitHub. I don't have to write any class definition because macro will do it for me. Oh. From query. So it will do a BigQuery dry run and generate classes, compile time uh, on the fly. So now I have a GitHub class. It has a two pretty string method. It's just case classes with type safe fields and all the nullable fields are option, which means if you deal, it, deal with it in a, in a uh, proper fashion, you're not, never gonna get null pointer errors in a run, uh, runtime uh, pipeline. So let's try get something in a type safe manner. So get rows again. BQ dot get typed rows, GitHub. I don't have to enter the query again because it's encoded in the class. Well, of course, I can I can override it with a different query, but in this case, I don't have to. Mm -hmm. And because the result table is already cached, I actually didn't execute another uh, query because why pay twice if I'm just you know getting the pre you know from the previous query? So now I get the rows. That's a GitHub class. I can just do author. It's option. So I know it's not now, so I get, which is not recommended in a real pipeline because you want to check if it's now. Mm, get name. I Again, I know it's not now, so I'll get, okay, it works. Great. Now let's plug that into a real pipeline. So I'll do SC, which is the shield context, similar to a Spark context. That's where you start your pipeline, so I can say, uh, uh, typed BigQuery of this type dot map and then I know this guy works so I can just do this basically getting a single leaf field out of this case class and then I want to do count by value say just, you know the users and the number of commits and then I can do a close and click basically say uh, Close this pipeline, run it, and collect the data from the result. Okay. And this is running on my laptop, so hope it doesn't blow up. I know it won't. There are only just a few thousand commits in the repo. Again, I get an iterator. So I can then for each print. Okay, those are the committers uh, of Shield repo. It's pretty easy. Now I know this works. Let's try it. Uh, with a fancier query, so type, and let's try it for real on the cluster or in the cloud. From query, Oops. define my query, and paste. Actually, I have I have it in here, so let's paste it from here. Okay. This time, instead of uh, looking for Spotify Shield repo, let's look for anything in a Spotify repo. So all I have to do is change the equal predicate to like a like, just string prefix match, simple. This will generate a little bit more data, so I don't want to run it on my laptop. Uh, okay. Let's call it GitHub 2. All right. The schema should be actually the same, but anyway, let's do another thing. So previously I was running everything on my lo uh, laptop. It's running in the so-called local mode. Now I wanna change the configuration, say, to run on Google Cloud. I have to do this thing, pass in a new parameter saying uh, 
use the Dataflow Pipeline Runner with this playground Google project running in the US East zone. And then with this GCS bucket, it's like the S3 of uh, Google Cloud bucket is temporary staging data set. I do that and then new context. Just basically give me a new SC that uh, corresponds to the, to the new pipeline that's gonna run on Google Cloud. So let's go back a little bit from my previous, to my previous uh, one-liner job. I'm gonna change this to uh, GitHub 2. And that's it, that's the only difference. I run it, it's gonna submit a job to the cloud and uh, we'll wait for like a minute or two. So it's uploading files and then a printed uh, URI that points to the job. I can click it. So you can see the transformation. I started with a type BigQuery, a map, and there's no line number here because it's not from a source file, just from the interactive console, but you get the idea. Let's, while we're waiting for this, let's move back to the slides. So. Uh, this is great. This makes it so much easier to adopt and people really like it. Uh, currently, I think there are 200, more than 200 users using Shio uh, and more than 400 production pipelines within Spotify. And last time I did these talks in November, there were 70 pipelines. So that's great. People just uh, pick it up and then use it. Most of them are new to Scala and to, to Shio. Most of them are from like a data science background, like using Python or R mostly, and not a problem. And we can, uh, they can learn pretty quickly and then pick up. We have people writing both uh, batch and streaming jobs. Streaming is mostly for dashboards, some experimental recommendation jobs as well. Externally, there are like a couple of companies using it. Some of them fairly large, but prefer to stay anonymous, I think. Collaboration is great. We built it as an open source project from the ground up. Everything is public on GitHub, uh, Slack, and Gitter. And there are external users helping each other on, on Gitter channel, so basically reduces <laughs> my role in the, in the support process. And people are submitting pull requests, feature enhancements uh, to the project as well, so it's, it's great. And three, that's the number of people at Spotify actually working on Shield. It's me and another two. One of them is a new hire, like fresh out of school, and we are basically supporting 200 plus developers and everyone else uh, extern uh, outside of the company. And it worked out pretty well. Use cases. So let's talk about some uh, real use cases within Spotify. Release radar, that's one of the latest features, recommendation features. It's basically recommending you tracks a new release tracks based on what you listened to before. And it's a more challenging project, uh, problem than Discover Weekly because we, Dis Discover Weekly is based on, or most of the recommendations based on collaborative filtering, like who listened to this track and also listened to other track. But if it's a new release, it means nobody has listened to it before. And then we have to do like audio analysis, fingerprinting, and based on artists and other metadata to figure out uh, who might like this track. And we use a lot of uh, Google tech as well, like Bigtable for serving production traffic. Bigtable is the original Google storage that inspired Cassandra and, and DynamoDB, and it's really scalable. Again, as a Google product, it's zero ops. You click a button, it spins up a cluster, and you just pound it with uh, terabytes of data uh, daily, and it works. And the, the entire pipeline is 120 lines of code. It's amazing. Fan Insights, that's the data portal that we provide to uh, artists and label managers. So basically I want to see, you know, what's the demographics, age, gender of the fans who listen to a particular album or track of this artist, and a lot of different dimensions. I think they have maybe hundreds of different, it's the artist track that's two dimension times different contexts, ge ge geography, demographic data, and then weekly, daily, and monthly aggregation. So a lot of dimensions. It used to be 150 plus Java jobs, now it's 10 jobs. And they, I think they process more than 20 terabytes of data daily. Master metadata, that's the catalog data of every single track inside Spotify, so that's uh, like 30 million tracks. 
the job, it's, it's not that big, but the complexity is huge because we're getting metadata from different content providers. They came in 26 data sources from various SQL databases. We dumped them to HDFS or, or in this case, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and then we do the join to pr pr provide one single data set that covers all the known attributes of a Spotify track. And it's 200 lines of code, that's what the diagram looks like. I had to do a lot of juggling to capture the screenshot. That's 26 inputs, a million joins, and I don't know what else is going on there, but it's, it's a fairly complex job. So that's great. And then we also wrote this tool called Big Diffy to help people migrate. So basically, let's say you have two data sets. How do you, like, uh, how do you, you want to compare the differences? There are, uh, I mean, if it's two text files, you can just do diff in Unix. But if it's two gigantic terabytes data sets, how do you do that? So the idea is uh, for the left and right hand side data set, we have a key function so we can map each pair of elements to a unique key. Then you do a, do a join or auto join or group by, then you have the pairwise uh, mapping. The, the elements, they can be any type, Avro, that's where we use the query or protobuf. So these schema data types can have many fields. In the case of metadata, it probably has 100 plus fields, a lot of them heavily nested. But for each leaf field, we can compute the differences, like delta, like you know, numerical fields, you just, it's a numerical difference. String, it could be an edit distance or whatever metrics you, you come up with. And we use a lot of vectors, like machine learning, you know, 40 dimension vectors to represent user preference. And in that case, it could be a cosine similarity. So now you have leaf level differences over the entire data set of every field and every uh, key. Then you can do the statistics on the data sets, like over a million records, how much different between these two data sets, the, what's the mean, max, um, average, and standard deviation. And you can ignore certain fields, like you know, unsorted or whatever. And so basically you can compute what are the keys missing that are the same or different or missing from the left-hand side, right-hand side? And then for, for the field level, you can compute all these uh, statistical uh, differences. It's great for validating pipelines. So let's say I have an old pipeline written in Python with no test, how, but it's worked for like 10 years. I know it works correctly. How do I know when the rewrite in Scala is, you know, behaves the same? You write a new version, compute the diff. If it's the same, it's the, it, it sort of works. You can sanity check uh, machine learning models as well. Like I tune the parameter, how much statistical difference you know between the two models instead of you know come up coming up with your own metric or another handwritten pipeline. You can do this automatically, which is great. Again, because it's written in Scala, the, the entire code is like 200 lines of code. This is the first part, basically mapping or massaging data into the shape I want. So you have this is a, like a pseudo code or simplified version of what it looks like. But basically you have the left-hand side, right-hand side, you key it, you do auto-join, now you have you know, the option for the left-hand side and right-hand side. You do this diffy, which computes the list of deltas, the fields that are different, and the numerical differences. Next step, uh, we map it into this map of string, which is the field name, and then the tuple is just the statistics I want to compute, long as the count, and then there's mean, max, moments basically captures average, a standard deviation uh, and third, second and third momentum. And then once you have all that, basically map everything into the shape of one. And the last line, dot sum, that's where all the computation happens. There's not a single line of computation that I write manually. This is because we use uh, algebra, the library for doing a statistical and approximate computation and basically uses Scala implicits and type classes to a compile time infer the type of computation I want to perform on this data type. Because the computation is represented or captured in the data type, I know it behaves correctly. I'm using a library that has been proven to work on such data types to, pre to produce predictable results. So that's what the pipeline looks like. Everything happens in four letters, dot sum. Again, it's great. Uh, there's no test for this pipeline because you don't, you don't really need it. So this is uh, exaggeration, but that's what a lot of people have been doing. Copy paste from your legacy code base to shield, run the big diffy, profit. 
the pipeline that we that we saw before, uh, it was rewritten from Java, the crazy one with 26 sources. They actually di discovered two bugs, some deduping problem with a repeated field or whatever with Big Div. You basically just wrote a new pipeline, run it, and then discover the bug. We use it for almost everything. Uh, A-B testing, those are pretty uh, complex pipelines doing like uh, statistical analysis. Um, again, ads, targeting, and monetization, those are fairly complex uh, stuff. And then audio, audio fingerprinting as well. So we have uh, a lot of ML data pipelines written in Shield. Yes. And that's, that's the end. Let's go back, just before we stop, let's go back. Oh, the, uh, the, the pipeline finished. Let's take a quick look. So I can see that the input is from a BigQuery, and this is the original query string. It has 20,000 elements, 52 megs, so slightly bigger than uh, small data, I guess. And then it wrote 8,000 elements. And you can see there's auto scaling in uh, action. I didn't specify the number of workers or any configuration. I figure out the input is fairly small, one worker, and then it spin up and tear down. That's it. Let's go back to the terminal as well. Just look at, okay, now here's my uh, data, the iterator. So let's say uh, to list. And then sort by uh, the second field, which is the count, and invert, so negative. Take, let's say, 20, and then for each, print, yeah. Okay. This didn't look sense, uh, didn't make sense when I first looked at it, but then I realized it's counting everything, every repo that st starts with uh, Spotify, but we have a forked Linux kernel. And that's why this guy has the most number of commits. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I'm way down there. That's my manager who wrote most of the early uh, machine learning code at Spotify. Um, yeah, that's it. So the pipeline works. Um, it's easy. And uh, yes, we already talked about your query. Let's move back. Yes, that's the end, and then I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Yes, yes. So at this point, have you guys, do you guys still use any of your old Hadoop infrastructure? We, we still use it because uh, there are jobs that's hard to migrate, and we're still in the progress of migrating them. So then do you see a future where you completely decommission? Yes, Hadoop? so I think the latest number is we, the number of new jobs on, on the Hadoop cluster, the existing on-premise cluster is not increasing, like people are actually moving, removing jobs. So that's a good thing, but it just takes time to migrate a lot of them. Especially the ones, complex ones in Python and nobody wants to rewrite, that takes time, because it takes time to spin up a new cluster and then port all the pipelines over, yeah. A lot of the cases, like the simple jobs, uh, I, I, I bragged about it, it, may or may not be true, it's faster to rewrite than spin up a Hadoop cluster in the cloud, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. So how applicable is this to non-big data? I mean, it seems like a very interesting tool set, but if we didn't have big data... Well, you can use it locally, but if you run it on a single machine, there are a lot of different tools. I think that's, at, at that point, it's a matter of preference. Like, if you, you're used to Python or R, like there are other tools for doing data analysis. This works well, great because it runs both locally and in the cloud on a lot of machines. And I guess there, you can use it with BigQuery, and it's more predictable than the, the dynamic, you know, uh, JSON-based BigQuery, and you can do a lot of data analysis with BigQuery plus this, the, the wiring and the custom logic. Yeah. Uh, I think I was just looking at a, one of your slides, and you mentioned something like 400 users. Um, 
what has been your experience of using Scala at such a scale with that many engineers at Spotify? It's it takes discipline. Luckily, we don't have a lot of like very diehard people who push for the like. It's not I'm against that. So for those of you not familiar, like in Scala, there's a subgroup of very uh, dedicated functional programming uh, users who try to write it in a more like Haskell style, but that tend to become more cryptic for entry level users. And I think the nice thing about Scala using it for data pipeline and most of a lot of our users have Java experience or Python, like you can write it as Java or Python and basically cheat your way through your pipeline. <laughs> yes, but if you if it gets your job done, I, I have no problem against it. There's it's always easier to refactor than writing a lot of code that's hard to reason about. So uh, yes, it takes discipline. We don't use a lot of the fancy features. The, uh, probably the fanciest when we, the, the, the only category theory concept we introduce to users is semi-group, because that's what you need for summing things in parallel in a predictable way. And we use macros and a little bit shapeless, but in a very contained environment, like we don't leak abstraction or, or interface to the users. Most of the time, you don't need to know what's going on under the hood. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do you think that uh, the conciseness of Scala has helped keep your code maintainable? Yes, I believe so. I think uh, on a couple of different reasons. It's it, it's short and the refactoring is easy. So a lot of the times, for example, the typical case you have you do like a join b, and the default join does a full shuffle and it's inefficient. Uh, that's a lesson I took from from Scotty. So you can you know just search replace join with sketch join or, or skew join or different variations of join that optimize based on the shape of your data set. It's easy to refactor in those cases. And it's short, which means it encourages people to discuss their code in Slack or in, over email. Like what we've seen in the past is people never ask for code review for Java pipelines because you send a pull request with like 20 files, like. 50 lines each, uh, 500 lines each, I'm not gonna go click through all the files, or, or I have to download the, the repo and then you know, load it up in IntelliJ and I have to you know, click around to understand it. Uh, most people stick to a very disciplined way of writing pipeline, like keep it short, everything you know, small and modular, and, and that really helped uh, like maintainable code, with writing maintainable code. So you mentioned that BigQuery you pay per byte, and that you also mentioned you guys query 500 petabytes, is that a day or a month? A month. That, are you guys using like on-demand, You're are, like that has to get really expensive at, at yes. some rate, right? So yes, you, it is expensive. Uh, it depends on how you see it. Developer time is also expensive. So sometimes you spend more, you know, like I, I'm not a power, a BigQuery power user, but for a lot of analysts like them spending, I don't know, a couple hours writing a query and then run it for another couple of minutes or hours to get a job done versus spending a month writing a pipeline that's unmaintainable, so that someone else has to fix, you know, five years down the road, it's a trade off. We do have some very expensive BigQuery's, but we have auditing internally and then when we, dis, deter, you know, detects certain outliers, we will opt optimize the query, which is, is doable and it's easier than optimizing a, a really, really bad, badly written pipeline. Yeah. And also because we are, I, I guess we, because we are one of the biggest Google Cloud users, we get some discounts. <laughs> yeah, discounts and also we get to access like, uh, you know, alpha beta features. So are you guys using the flat rate pricing then, or are you guys using still on-demand pricing for querying? That I don't know. Sorry, I, I, I'm not the one paying the bills. So. Any <laughs> <laughs> yeah, questions? I guess that's it then. Right.
Thank you.